The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another episode of The Engine Room. We're on tour. We're actually literally under the Story Bridge in, in Brisbane, uh, quite an iconic space, and um, I'm uh, lucky enough to be uh, seated right next to Angus Cooper, who is the founder of Accrue Wealth, who's going to regale us with um, how he's kicked off this business, the lessons that he's learnt, and where he wants to take the business in the future. But welcome to the what, – what's, what's the name of this place? Crystal Brook. Yeah, look the Crystal Brook, yeah. The, the Crystal Brook. So, everyone, apparently it's fancy pants. Lots of cool pictures in, 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 in their in reception. Um, but welcome to the Crystal Brook and to the engine room. Thanks for having me, Mr. Andrew Rock. So, I think you'd think if you're hanging out under the Story Bridge, you're going to be hanging out with um with hobos and whatnot. But this place is legit fancy, you know? It is. There's no trolls. No. What's, no. what's the no. troll under the bridge? Exactly. Well, unless we count. I don't know. But... Um, this feels far nicer than a troll under the bridge. There's a reason why this is no. There's no visual, so um, it's uh, you've got your Shrek vibe going on there. So, um, but you're not actually your business. You've, you've come down to Brisbane t- today, but your business is actually in the Sunshine Coast. Is that where you're from? Maybe give us a bit of a hey. for how you made your way there. Exactly right. We um, so I actually grew up in Sydney um, and really loved it. It was a great place to grow up. Uh, we moved to. Brisbane, I like to say we moved up to Brisbane to get on with our adult lives. You know, partly it was the cost of real estate, I think. Um, but yeah. And what, what, how old were you when you did that? Very good question. 12 years ago. How old am I now? So I guess sort of 31 ish. Okay. Yeah, we moved up. Um, Economic migrants. Kind of. Yeah, we, we moved up. It's funny. There's guys I played rugby with back in Sydney that would say, if they were from Queensland, they'd say, I'm going to move back to Queensland when I raise a family. Uh, my sister lived up here because my brother-in-law is a pilot, so he's based out of Brisbane. And we'd come and visit and she'd have real estate brochures on a coffee table and say, look how cheap property is here. And I'm like, cool. But if I leave Sydney, I'm going to go somewhere cool, right? Like London or Melbourne, not Brisbane, right? But Brisbane was fantastic. It was really, really good for us. We um we got a dog. We bought a house. We got married. We had kids, I think, in that order. And um yeah, and then about four or five years ago, we moved up to the Sunshine Coast and kicked off a, a business and uh, it's sort of evolved into a crew wealth as we kind of know it now. So you were an economic migrant coming to Brisbane from Sydney. Um, you did mention off air that you grew up in the ghettos of Mossman. Which it was, was tough, yeah. <laughs> which for everyone from Sydney knows that that's probably the furthest from a ghetto in, 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 in history. Um, making the decision to then go from, from Brisbane City to uh, the Sunshine Coast, was that also another um, lifestyle decision, like another economic migration? Uh, I wouldn't say it was numbers driven, actually. Like we had a fantastic social life in Sydney and I, I absolutely loved it. Some of my absolute favourite humans were in and around us there, I guess. But um yeah, I kind of I guess I'd say it's to get on with our adult lives, you know. We kind of detached. I think everything we did here we could have done in Sydney. I think some of it was just easier. You know, it was a, a bit of a detachment, um, a bit of a reset, you know, we um I feel like we made more proportional headway talking to the numbers on the property that we bought in Brisbane than we could have in Sydney. Um, so even at the time, maybe if you're foregoing a little bit of salary, but 
you know, we, I think proportionally, I don't know, I got the sense people were happier here, if I'm allowed to say that. Maybe it's a little bit more hot. We're not going out to any other state, mate. They're well, at the border, like, no, I don't think anyone else will hear that, right? It's more it's like a train gauge. Stop the border. To Sydney, though, and I drive in Sydney, and I used to be that guy. 100% I used to be that guy, and I just feel like telling people in their cars to cheer up a bit. You know, like, what's the, you know, a little bit more rat race factor? And, and Brisbane's probably got plenty of that also. But, yeah, what would kind of say we're just getting better at moving. Sunshine Coast is even nicer. No, but there's no doubt, and lots of... Lots of um, uh, people did make that migration, especially during COVID. But, you know, coming back to um, what you were trained in, you, uh, I'm reading off your uh, your LinkedIn profile here that you uh, you did a Bachelor of Commerce and Arts Finance Communication. Couldn't be more broad. So you did that. What drew you to financial planning? Because it looks like you got there pretty quickly. It looks that way, but it's certainly not the case at all. Okay, so the uh, I think organically in terms of um, education, I'm drawn more to the human side of things. So, you know, art and English and that sort of stuff I loved at, at high school. Um, I did some philosophy communications and that sort of thing at, at university through the art side of thing. I think the commerce was more something that might actually get me a job. Thanks, mum and dad. Did your parents make you yeah. do that bit? <laughs> I beat you. Yeah, thanks, mum and dad. That's um, Dad... I, I don't know. I think if you look at the ingredients and if this is how biology worked, it would make sense. Dad used to write books on capital gains tax. Um, Gordon Cooper, who's a doyen of, he was the guy for capital gains tax. Um, with the ATO would talk to him about legislation changes and that sort of stuff. Well, so, let's get the link here and let's, this is nostalgic link time. I think we could, uh, he's nodding over there. We definitely, can you, can you supply us a link there? Cause we'd love to, love to get that lineage. That would have been, well, capital gains tax. Came in 1987 or something? 86. 86, was yeah. it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, but the, no, 85, let's go. That's it. Um, the, so dad came over from England and, and was an accountant and he sort of specialised in this thing and yeah, he wrote loads of books on it. He could give a presentation to a bunch of his peers on capital gains tax and it could be entertaining. So I reckon there's some sort of weird skill in there. Um, Mum was a psychiatrist, Roxy, so... This is all about people, you know, um, and so for me, if you blend the two. Your degree literally was a homage, a 50-50 to mum and dad. Yeah, by accident, I would say. Um, no wonder you played rugby on the weekend and ran into bits. I used to love going to barbecues and, and people would say, you don't seem like an accountant because that's that's where I kicked off. Um, I think I was a very unfulfilled accountant for a long time, uh, but worked for an absolutely magic firm in Bondi Junction. Can I? Can I call them out? Of course, mate. Of course. Sask and Clark, they were, they're like family to me still. They're friends. Um, and I think they knew that I had more in me also, you know. So, um, and they were honest enough and part the ego enough to be able to tell me that as long as well as my darling wife, Carly. Um, and so, yeah, I did a career changer course. Well, you were there for five years between. 2005 and 2010. It's it's worse than that, actually, Rob. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you know how um, some kids go and do work experience at cool places like the zoo or, you know, sailing on the harbour or something like that? I worked in the accounting firm in year 10 um, and then worked there through uni holidays and then got a full-time job afterwards. So um, absolutely lovely place to be, though, like, you know, and very formative, as I've come to realise, in terms of um, workplace culture. Um Sort of struck me that having a, a positive and a and a warm culture, maybe it's harder to do, but the rewards are greater. Um, and they had the sort of place they had people working there into their mid seventies. And, and Baskin Clark um, is that that's still a going concern? Absolutely, uh, yeah. Cool. It's back Baskin Clark Priest now. Yep. Um, and yeah, I'm proud to see them kicking goals, and and they're still friends and mentors of mine. And I'm sure that they look at you and they're pretty proud of um, what you're kicking around as well. I, I don't know. I, I hope so. Um, I actually lost my father a, a few years ago um, with an accident. So, yeah, a lot of these people, I think I've come to realise that these people have known me most of my life, people like that, and a lot of dad's friends that are wonderful professionals, accountants, lawyers, you name it. Getting to know them professionally as well, I'm like, oh, they're good. They are so good. They're really, really good at their craft as well as lovely people. So kind of getting to know them professionally has been a treat as well. Which, um, and look, sorry to hear that about your, your father. After speaking so glowingly about, you know, his legacy, you clearly have a, a real affinity for him. So um, um, what made you pivot from accounting? Because you, you went and did the accounting certificate. You thought this debit and credit things, obviously it gets the ladies because uh, you've managed to jack right, a good one. I love that. Yeah. Correct. I mean, who doesn't like balancing the books? Um, 
But what made the parlay from um, accounting into um, financial planner, which well, I believe right. you, you, you were part of the Horizons Academy. Exactly there. right. So it's a career changing program. Uh, it's funny that you kick off by saying, well, it looks like you got there pretty quickly. Even my wife would say uh, a while back, she was like, you know, it's all good for you because you love this, you know, and I'm like, I didn't know this is where I was heading though, to be honest. And the ingredients make a lot of sense when you look backwards. I'm a registered tax agent, which turns out it's really useful, but I don't want to do your tax return. You know, I didn't get many fist pumping moments knocking out tax returns and financials, but yeah, really, really useful background to have, I suppose. So the career change thing, uh, it, I just, I tried it and it was my thing. Um, I found my grooves there, you know, and it's not for everyone. And it was probably still full of a bit of propaganda and product flog in terms of, you know, um, pushing super and, and insurance. And we're like, when are we going to do strategy? And they're like, yeah, you just did. I'm like, no, that's not. <laughs> but it was a wonderful start. And I've got friends through that still. Oh, there's a massive amount of, I mean, I've interviewed practice owners on this and podcast. I think, I think you know Ray Jaramus, who helped found um, Ensemble and that's a. Well, well, actually, actually, Ray. Um, Adrian, Clayton, Adrian and ben, Patty, exactly. Like, they were all part of that program, and um, uh, which you know, when we look at Ensemble and what we're trying to do with the positive evolution of financial advice, um, there's a real gap in that that market of bringing people through. Which, which we you know, we might we might touch on how you're doing that in your practice or what you're proposing, um, but that that talent shortage and uh, although the uh, institutions did ob- have an obvious product bias, I think that. Um, if you looked past that, they they were the they were the funnel that brought quality people into the industry. And some of these graduate programs, like like the the big evil banks had and that sort of thing, but they there's a lot of wonderful people that came through that thing because there's nothing else like it now. So there's been a bit of a dark gap, right? In yeah. terms of how do you how do you find these people and how do they get education and how do they get experience? So it, it was certainly a start, and um, I was very grateful for it. They even had an award. Um, they had a Benjamin Short Award, which I was super proud to win. And what was that for? Um, one of my coaches, it was a little bit peer and coach voted. So my granddad said, does that mean you're the biggest suck up? I'm like, well, no, uh, I hope not. But the it, it was, um, yeah, I don't know, I was proud to win because it, it was, I looked at my cohort of people that I went through and there's some amazing people, you know, um, and I feel like that was a that was a nice shot in the arm for someone who'd being an unfulfilled accountant, going into advice and going, yeah, I like this thing and I'm good at it. Why? Okay. Why? Why? What? I mean, what's the accounting's a fantastic basis of of understanding the the playbook of of a person scenario, but what was the the real meat in financial planning that drew it? I think it it it's so simple that it doesn't sound profound, but it it absolutely is because it it brings the technical background with people. You know, it's how do you transpose stuff for real human beings that have real human problems and don't get excited by tax legislation and and that sort of thing. But the changes that you can do with structures and stuff like that, they can be life-changing for human beings. So that's the best part of it, I think, is bringing the the technical and the human parts together and and making it digestible and approachable and and, um, exciting for people. And do you think that's that's one of your superpowers, being able to make complex things Sound. I, I think it's simple. I think a good that. advisor should be able to do that. I think I'm quite good at it. Um, but I, I think that having the human part of it, <clears throat> the empathy, I think that's the part that you can't fake. So, you know, it's about connecting with people and actually understanding their story and, and trying to get into that and understand like, what are their problems? What are they trying to solve? What makes them happy? Um, and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I think after the Horizons program, I went and worked for a firm here in Brisbane that was. Um, Bravian had a satellite office. They were Canberra-based business, but a satellite office here in Brisbane and was ingrained in a background of um, values-based financial planning. Awesome. You've heard of Bill Bacharach? Yep. Not Bert yep. Bacharach, yep. Katrina, but yeah, he. Um, if you haven't heard of that, guys, absolutely check it out. It's amazing. But I guess at its core, if you're understanding a human being and their values, it's actually the step before goals. And if you're looking at that and then you understand someone's goals but the motivation behind them as well. I feel like that's a huge leg up to giving them good advice. So rewind a bit. So, because I'm just, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that you, your mum was a psychiatrist. Is that right? That's right. So um, you got any siblings? What was the family table like? So, you know, when you're growing up, you've, you've, I'm really interested in this dynamic because myself and my wife, she's also in that, that field and um, uh, quite similar. And our, our three uh, children, or Petri dish, 
as as they refer to themselves, um, had really interesting conversations. So what was it like growing up intellectually at the dinner table? I was, I think, um, a really good communicator, really good conversation. Like I had friends of all ages that would say, "Your mum is so good to talk to," and I'm like, "Yeah, she is." I had other friends that said, "Do you think that she, you know, did her psychiatry stuff on you?" And I'm like, "I don't know, maybe." But he says, twitching, "I don't know, maybe I would have been a whole lot worse." But yeah, no, she's a very good communicator. Um, uh, in, in a very different way to the way my father was, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it all sort of melds together. But it's about understanding people and trying to understand where they're coming from. And we've been talking um, for a few minutes now. And when we started, you, you said, oh, we moved here, we moved there. I'm insinuating, you're insinuating that you must have met your wife to be quite early on. How did you guys meet? Hey, this is super corny, but I am super corny. I'm big old sort. But it was actually at the Horizons program, we were challenged to do a goals, uh, a goals, a vision. You know, you had to present to essentially a room full of strangers, 35 or odd people about what your goals were, right? And even focus on that for a second, the idea of doing goals and writing them down and making them explicit, it's a really good idea, right? But ego gets in the way and I'm like, that is a really good idea, but I'm smart and I don't need to do that. But doing this thing is where I wrote down the first house I'd like to buy, I'd like to have a cool dog, um, I'd like to get married and have a family one day. And in saying that, and I was like, well, who's it going to be? And I'm like, well, it's definitely going to be Carly, right? <laughs> so I told a room full of near strangers that I was going to marry Carly and, yeah, our next overseas trip I proposed. Um, she's certainly been a huge part of the journey for me, to be honest. Um, I think like any good partner, it's about challenging you to be your best, which doesn't mean disappointed with who you are, but knowing how do I coax you and give you the, the confidence to do something different and be be who you can be, you know? Um And... We'll touch on a, a bit later. That you, you, Carly's in your business as well. You guys are, operate that business together. And um, uh, my personal background is my long-suffering wife also um, helped me out in the business. And it has its positives and negatives. And it'd be really interesting because quite a lot of the listeners may or may not be in this situation with a husband, wives, boyfriend, girlfriends, or um, or whatever. And just how you navigate it and what you think you do well. Actually, let's do it now. Okay. Let's do it now. What you think you do well in managing that uh, that dichotomy of relationship with your partner, your, your wife, in the business? And what do you think are lessons that you can improve on just for the benefit of people listening? I think being conscious of what it can and can't be um, is she works remotely. So even though we're close to our office, she's not working from the office. Um, and well, there's, there's there's a takeout. If yeah. We're- well, look, we had, we had reservations. About, I've heard about models where someone's partner works in the business. What if they're crap? Like, how do you tell someone, how do you tell the boss that their partner's crap, you know, or we talked before about examples that you've known about, uh, you know, the standard that you walk past is the standard you accept sort of thing. So it can be really toxic. It can be really destructive, not in this context. So I just want to hasten to add. Um, so we were kind of mindful of that. We were mindful of perception. Um, turns out she is brilliant though. She's very difficult not to like, and she did a business degree and got distinctions and she's You've got a huge creative flair. She's um, got wonderful taste in everything but husbands, clearly. But the yeah, she's um, you know she's designed our website. She's designed our. We've had clients come into our office and say, "I love this. Who did it for you? Can can they do our house?" Um, and so, and and so one of your takers is that you do re- remote work. So effectively, there is there is a physical uh, separation there. Um, you you mentioned um, you know that you have to be good at it, but. Um, how do you um, – so when – with your other team members, um, h- how do you integrate like that relationship into talking with, say, new advisors and whatnot? Because as you say, if I'm an advisor and I'm thinking of maybe coming into your business and maybe bringing my client book or, 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 or whatever, I'm thinking, okay, well, what's the value proposition here? Um, so do you, do you both have things like um, uh, em- job descriptions, employment, yeah, stuff absolutely. like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Roxy, some of these things that um, you would tell someone like a client to do, she helped make them happen and help make them real. She's not the only one. Um, there's other people in our business that do this too. Um, but I think we call it internal marketing as well as the expression. But if you rock up at, at our business, she's the reason why our process manual looks like a legitimate corporate process manual. Um, she's the reason why our website looks like a real website. And I hope it has a little bit of individuality about it because my concern is that Every financial advisor website says the same thing, um, even if they mean it at 
at their core. They, um, everyone says we care about your goals and dreams and we're going to do a, a tailored plan just for you and help your goals and dreams come true and that sort of stuff. And that, like, yeah, hell yeah, that's what we want. That's what we do. But um, the, I don't know, it, I feel like it's still got our voice about it and that's really important. So she's good at extracting that sort of stuff. So coming back to your question, if you're joining our business, I don't think you're going to be conscious or concerned about the fact that, you know, there's a husband and wife in this business and when you come to know us, you're probably even going to like us. Yeah, well, so, and, so. And, and look, self-awareness is a big part, right? So, um, and what do you do outside? Like before we get into the, the nitty-gritty of the practice, um, you, you mentioned um, off, off air earlier that you, you've had two days here in Brisbane. This is the second day. You're coming to a uh, an Ensemble Growth Alliance program this afternoon, which is um, which is wonderful. Thank you in advance. Hopefully, you get a fair bit out of it. Um, but what do you do outside of of running this business um, to to I suppose give yourself that balance? I think there's a couple of things in there. I reckon that the idea of balance is one to tread carefully with. I think understanding that things get out of balance at times is okay so long as it's not what your normal is. You know, so if you can see it for what it is, sometimes work takes precedence, sometimes family does. It's how life goes, right? Like if you had health events, then that's what you should focus on. You know, with with us, I think. A celebration for me, I guess, being able to be here and work on the business is testament to my team, the crew. We call them the, the A crew, mate. Because I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. I've got to read yeah. some language off it, your website. And is they, it, they, does that they, mean I can now call you Gus instead of Angus? Have we gone there? If you're ready. Yeah, if we're I'm, ready. I'm ready if you are. Okay. So, I'm Roxy yeah. and you're Hello, Gus. Roxy. Nice to meet you. Look at um, look, the A crew, they are bloody brilliant. You know, like they, it's not just a case of holding the fort and I hope that they don't do something atrocious. Like I have so much faith in these guys and, Feels like not so long ago it didn't feel like that. So life was out of balance. Um, the fact that we can come here, we came to a, a thing yesterday, which is about um, employee share schemes, you know, um, KPIs, remuneration, reward, that sort of thing. So a thing that coming back to your other part before, I'd say that with um, Carly, she helps these good ideas actually happen. And again, she's not the only one, but she helps these things actually happen. So it's a real treat when you look up. Um, we were watching Dr. Craig West yesterday. I don't know if you're familiar He's with him. He's an exit specialist. There you go. So, And my mentor challenged me years ago. He said, you should have a pitch pack ready, okay? So being exit ready is not the same as wanting to sell, right? But if you've got your business financials, your game plan, your business plan, your SWOT analysis, uh, yeah, your financials, your projections, if they're ready to go, it's easy to find um, finance because they know that you've got your stuff together and you've got your story. Um, imagine showing that to a prospective shareholder and saying, you know, here's where we're going. And they go, oh, hey, these guys have thought about it. And then it's a thing that you can update and edit. And it turns out it's really good for you as well because it means that you've got a good handle of your business. So these sort of things, coming back to yesterday, I'm watching this stuff going, this is really, really good gear. And instead of taking voracious notes, which I do, I can't help myself, and hoping that I'm going to do a decent job of transposing this data to my wife and my team, she's sitting next to me. So it's like watching a good movie. I then had something to debrief, Whoa, someone to debrief. So, so let's talk about movies because when you said uh, that your 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 mentor, who is your mentor by the way? Paul, shout out Paul Body Mead. There he is. A shout out Paul. Yeah, he's he was very dear friend of my uh, father's, and um, um, <laughs> I think early doors he'd be embarrassed me saying this, but I offered to pay him because I thought he was that valuable, and he said no way. Um, well, you, you've you've spoken. To, I spoke to you yesterday as to arrange details here. I spoke to you earlier today, and you've you've referenced him every time I've spoken to you about. He's what a good dude. Guy. He's done he's done the stuff that we were, like. I used to have a, a multidisciplinary practice. We used to do accounting and advice. Yeah, right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So we um, I, now I do advice. That's my thing, right? That's what I wanted to do. But he's done the thing on a bigger scale, and I think like a good coach or mentor or anyone giving you good advice, it's not just about what you want to hear. And you're doing great, mate. And a back pat and a and a head scratch is kind of. I, I've done that. That doesn't really work. Um, or try this thing because um, we we did that a bunch of times, and here's the thing that we found works really well. So I've learned so much from him, and I really enjoy hanging out with him. He's got really wonderful taste, so we go to some really cool places around Brisbane. Um, and yeah, it, it's wonderful to catch up with him, eat good food, and have a glass of wine and talk about stuff. Perfect. So shout out, Chad. It's good to have people who give back. Um, which you know is kind of what's actually happening right now for everyone listening. Um, the when you you said you had a previous practice that was accounting and whatnot, and you've you've moved across. I met you virtually 
a couple of years ago when you inquired about um, uh, one of my businesses, uh, VVP helping out with, you, with you, your business. So you made the move purely into advice which um, and into a, a crew wealth. Um, and effectively, uh, given that you've come from accounting, what was the what was your passion for for, for doing a standalone business? Uh, to break that down a little bit, I'd say I think there's remember the Venn diagrams from high school, the overlapping circle. I love a Venn diagram. Yeah. The I think there's so much overlap between accounting and advice, right? But they are different functions, so they serve different purposes. But the the concept of the overlap was the cross pollination of ideas and. Uh, it's the same as us working now within someone else's professional, their lawyer, their accountant, um, what their mortgage broker, whatever it may be, you know, to help bring things together, um, not to claim project manager, but to help bring these things to a point and, and to a purpose and resolve things. Um, accounting and advice, we were like, we should absolutely be having this thing together. And I still think there's immense potential with that in particular. I think the thing we didn't do particularly well was cross-pollinate. I think that our accountants didn't really... And it's not their fault, it's ours. They didn't really understand what advice was. Um, but a lot of them are amazing practitioners and I'm still friends with them. And the I don't think this is the first time this story's been played out. What do you mean? Oh okay. as as far as as far as the different disciplines, sometimes just because you put things next to each other doesn't right. mean that they, they have the correct instruction manual, the motivation. You know, you mentioned you talk you, you you're learning about ESOP, for instance. Well, what that tells me is that as a as an employer you're very open to other people sharing in the gain yeah. of the overall firm. So, you know, there's, there's there's kind of a bit of a mentality there. But just to, to change gears and to go into the details about the business that you're in now, I'm going to read from your website. We are built by people who want genuine engagement for people who want genuine engagement. We know our stuff. We understand our stuff and we care. We get things done, but we're not stuffy or scared of enjoying the process with you. That comes directly off you, the accrue well, website, it just gives the feeling that you're a sleeves rolled up, which you've actually got your sleeves rolled up uh, today, kind of operator, and that once you get to know the people that you also can execute. You know, we've spoken about your why, what sort of people you're, you, you do, but I'd love to know a little bit about what, what are the sort of clients that um, you've currently got in your client base and what, what's your aspirational avatar? It's a, it's a really good question. I think um, one thing I feel lucky about, you know how everyone loves to tell you their favorite podcast or book that they've read, but there's one called Your Next Five Moves by Patrick Bet Davis. There you go, Kieran. Um, but yeah, one of the takeaways of that for me, and this is only a recent one, right? So this is not the start out position, um, was that one of the biggest influences for efi um, efficiency is trust. And it again, it shouldn't sound profound, but when someone... If you understand them and they know that you understand them and they trust you, then you don't have to prosecute, uh, prosecute again the fact that you're intelligent, you know your stuff and you're worth trusting. You can kind of say, here's some ideas and here's what we do next and here's this piece of strategy. Do you connect with the logic of it? Great. Shall we do this for you? You know. So um, the other thing is a long time ago I was challenged to build an ideal client profile um, and so it's a thing that I've had at my core and it's probably been updated a little bit over the years but five key elements of that um, and my favorite people to work with have most of these qualities you don't have to have all of them um so pen and paper everyone here it comes here you go um so they have complexity to solve so we believe in real work that's where we add our value right like is is so we don't believe in manufacturing work uh, we're not the only advice business that's really busy at the moment so we don't need fake work um so if they have complexity to solve then we can probably add value um, if they have wealth and they have income, right, and that number shifted over time. So, um, you know, it's as simple probably as you can do more with more. Um, you, you make a 2% difference on $7 million, it's very different to making a 2% difference on $70,000. Um, yet some of my favorite people to help, um, you know, I used to be guilty of bringing in all the lost dogs, like I'm a bleeding heart. Um, so helping real people at, at the other end is also immensely rewarding, I find. Um, but if so qualities two and three are having wealth and having income. Um, then in terms of um, these people, they outsource. So, yeah, so they're delegators. Yep. Yep. Um, and there's different elements of that for me. They seek advice, they accept advice, they follow advice, and they pay for advice because they're all slightly different qualities, I think. So they value the overall. That's it. Play. Yep. The, 
quality number five, there's an acronym. I'll keep it as an acronym, but the Sydney Swans, I think, used to run an NDHP policy. That the I can say it. I imagine it's got to do with dickheads. It does. Yeah, no <laughs> dickhead policy. Uh, not to broadcast it, but it's, it's probably more the qualitative part about what it's like to deal with someone. Um, I think with the privilege of tenure now with a lot of my clients, I realise how freaking lovely some of them are. I I love that a lot of them are so grateful, even new clients. And I'm like, that is my absolute kick. You know, these people that just go, this is, I was scared of this and now I'm excited. I'm like, how good is that? So they're loyal, they're easy to work with, um, they're responsive, they're grateful and they're referred. Do they come from a particular industry or are they employed or, or, or not employed? And, and yeah, you look, know, the, how many do you have as far as family units? I think in terms of family units, we're probably pushing 160 or 180. Yep. Um, we're actually refining the starter at the moment. Um, it's only a few years into the new co, yeah? That's right, yeah. yeah. So I had um, some friends and family that I took with me into business when I worked in Brisbane at Templeton's. Um, and um, from there, I took a selection, kind of based on this criteria, funnily enough, um, of my favorite clients. We bought them when I set up you know, my own business. Um, so I had... I would argue, a very distorted sample of clients. So my associate that was working with me at the time, I was like, it, it's a funny word of caution, but these people are not normal. They're lovely. You know, they they have income, you know, all these qualities. These are not your standard slice of Australian, um, you know, households. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of the retirees on the Sunshine Coast, that's what my perspective was. But actually, I think the Sunshine Coast is immensely entrepreneurial. Yeah, uh-huh. it, 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 well, it is. It is. I mean, it's um, uh, it's a real mix, isn't it? It's yeah. probably that way is probably increasing, and the standard retiree. This is the lifestyle piece, though, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, moving away from the big city, COVID pushed that a lot. Yeah. Um, especially on the Sunshine Coast. Um, I think uh, I caught myself saying we deal with um, retirees and pre-retirees, and then the semantics nerd in me is like, isn't that everyone? They're retired or they're pre-retired. Anyway, I think in our world, this is like on the run up to retirement. Um, well, well you, you, you pre-retired the moment you start work. <laughs> and and my favourite euphemism on the SOA, it says, here's how much you have at retirement and here's how much you have at the end of retirement. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> what, we go back to work? I'm like, well, you could. Yeah, that's one way of dodging it. Oh, um, uh, goodness. And and so um, I'm reading your process here. Um, a lot of people, as you pointed out, have pretty standard websites, pretty standard things. But um, uh, going through the accrued journey, um, you've got the reach out the discovery, but most importantly, step three, which is the smile workshop. So um, um, that's not um, homage to a, 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 an orthodontic or dentist-based clientele. Um, tell me about the smile. Yeah. So the smile, oh, to me, this is rubber on the road stuff, right? This is when you kind of say, hey, these are the things you asked us to point out, your your goals. Um, funnily enough, I think that's the suit, that's the most important part of the discovery piece when you're first getting to know someone. Um, is actually unpacking some really solid goals, you know, the whole SMART goal acronym, but built around the things that they want and built back by the values that they have. When we're firm that, and have confirmed by them that we're pointed at the right goals, this is when we come back to them and say, here's what we're thinking. So um, we sort of talk about a strategy sketch that we'll build out with people and kind of say, here's the things that we're hoping to do. Um, if there are things in conflict, I think this is a good opportunity to say, here's what it gives up. We say with our clients... Um, it's not an old school doctor prescription where we say, we've looked at your stuff and we know what's best for you. Um, take this pill and suck it up. It's Retirement maybe is my favorite trade-off to explain to a client. You want this income at this age? Um, it doesn't look like you're going to get there, maybe. Do you work a bit longer to get the income that you want or do you retire with a bit less? You know. And I think that there's a fluidity in that comment um, over the last 10 years around, especially with COVID, enabling people who maybe would have retired at a certain age to maybe investigate um, a sort of more fractional work, which is awesome. Exactly. So I think for me, rubber on the road stuff, when you're saying here's the stuff we talked about, and we have talked about it. So we believe in no nasty surprises as well. It's not always, but I've learned the hard way with that, is that for all the right reasons, you, you can propose something and it turns out someone goes, you're not moving my super fund. I'm like, why not? And it's cheaper and the, you know, the returns look stronger and these investment qualities that you said were really important to you. So we like to ask what someone's non-negotiables are. Here's another Venn diagram. It's the it's what you can do, like yep. literally what you can do. Circle number one. Yeah, circle number two would be what you should do. And for me, that's the lizard brain rational part. It's all driven by the math. This is what you should do. Yep. 
And the third part is what you want to do. Yep. So kind of bringing these ingredients together is what we try to do to, to build good advice. Well, let's talk about how you buddy do it, right? So so in your, um, you've got 180 uh, family units. Um, you're, you're the lead advisor still in the tools, although we, there is a potential that you will phase more into running the business of the business. Is that correct? As I think I'm celebrating having more time to work on the business. Yep. I don't think I'll ever be the guy that has no clients because I, I feel with that carries a risk of, uh, forgetting what advice really is. And you've structured, so give me an idea of the org structure here. It looks like you've got um, a couple of associate advisors coming through. Is I'll hop on that super quick. Yeah. And you think of the, I'm not the first with this, but sort of like the legal and accounting professions, they have associates um, on their way through to, so there's people, some of the best support I've had, I should call out, never want to be advisors. They never want to be client facing. Yep. They're, um, you know, they're immensely warm, they're enormously competent, all that sort of stuff. They don't want to be advisors. That's fine. Then there are people that want to be advisors, and I think the sort of the associate function is my favourite way of getting them there. So you would you would classify, you've got two associates, Kurt. We've got, we've got Mick and Dan at the yep. moment, yep. Um, and, and they're spectacular. And I will say this, I, I've had associates in the past and these two guys that are better than some advisors that I've known. And so are you putting them through the PY? Is that part of it? They've actually both done it. Okay. Um, oh, well done. Mick, Mick's already done. He's been an AR before. Yep. Um, Dan is, he will be up and running in the new year is the intent as an AR. Um, it's, I don't have Messiah complex. I don't want to be the only one that's important to my clients. The only one that. Well, my listeners know that I, I started off being the number one advisor at my practice. And then uh, eight years after I t- took on advisors, I was the the number, whatever the last number was. Hey, I'm including pretty- my members of my family would regularly go, geez, it's so good you passed me on. <laughs> You know, yeah, I've also heard you talk about, and I've had this before when I've, you know, left a business and, you know, I've got these clients and, and I'm not taking these clients with a solid client handover. And you like to think you're really important to these people. And some of them, look, the most flattering thing would be someone that says, can I come with you? But it's not, a lot of them are like, okay, yeah. see ya. Um, but yeah, I think um, Mick and Dan, are, um, they have wonderful advice brains, and that for me is that critical thinking. They really nerd out on advice with me, and I, I love that. So I'm and- going to challenge you on the lizard brain. Yeah, okay. So you've got yourself, and you've got 180 fee-paying clients, and you've got two advice associates and some other associates who are, who are equally important will come to sort of their roles, and, and you've even got some um, outsourcing uh, in the business as well. Um, the biggest uh, challenge of a business structure like yours is their ambition – to become advisors and the interplay of that and your number of fee-paying clients at the time they do. So uh, how, are you, how are you intending on um, uh, creating an environment where either you attract a bunch more new organic clients, you buy some clients or, or you pass some on in order for them to have the standalone pillars? We have built the thing that we have now because we needed capacity. There's way more than mm-hmm. I could do and more than I want to do. I don't want to be the only guy. I'd like to have at least two probably three other advisors that aren't me in the business. Um, so let's have that as a starting point. And then you have, they've got to have enough to keep them busy. Um, and this is like looking after our existing clients and finding new clients to be existing clients. Our, our favorite is to have clients that want to go on a journey with us for that trust element. You know, you can do more with 10 years than you can with one, right? Oh, so- oh, absolutely. But there's always a commercial dichotomy um, as far as as far as far getting that, that critical mass of, of handing over. So um, – uh, you do have a, a marketing. So how, how do you market to new potential clients? Look, we've um, this is a thing that's actually been happening recently. Um, I was told if I refer to Carly as a marketing guru, she'll leave me, so make sure I don't do that. Um, we'll edit that out, Kira. Yeah, please do. Um, but it's, it's about actually having, look, the socials and stuff, I think I'm more surprised by the lurkers, the people that see things and don't comment or whatever, but I found clients come to me interstate through friends of friends and I'm like I had no idea they even knew what we were doing it's outrageous it's, so, out, it's outrageous the lurkers but it just shows you lose the game you don't play so if you're not doing it it's not there and they don't see it and that person doesn't find you so and people don't don't react to the first time they see you online you build a, a whole trust infrastructure you don't even know about exactly right it's um I spoke with a, a chap the other day on a video call and um he's doing a podcast like this in three or four weeks. And he goes, it's weird seeing you. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I've only ever listened to you. Yeah. And yeah. you realize, because you forget when, when, you're, when you're talking in an intimate setting like we are now that, that there are people listening and learning. So, But don't you think that's the weird thing with um, ascribed trust, that 
Um, I don't know if it's quasi celebrity or something, but if someone's written a book, all of a sudden they're an authority. You know, if you've heard them online or you've seen them on telly or or you can find them when you Google them, then they must be a big deal and they must be important, right? But it turns out we're all humans and, um, yeah. So um, I'm looking at your licensee and there's been a recent change in your licensee. So you, um, after going through the Horizons Academy way back when, you found yourself licensed through um, AMP. That's correct? right, yeah. Which um, uh, only recently has has moved into the entirety um, family. And I did a whole podcast with the, the entirety guys um, a few weeks ago, I suppose in relation to where you see yourself, you've got that as a license, um, which has been a pretty solid license over the years. But for more intensive purposes, the way you run is is very much your own race. I love that you say that. That's really important to me. I think long before a Royal Commission, that was important to me. And I'd sort of get up on my soapbox a little bit about it and maybe clients didn't care as much as I did. But we were, we were licensed, like everyone's got to be licensed by someone. Yep. The concept of self-license is my favourite academically, like a tax agent. Yeah. Yeah, there's a more direct nexus between what you do yep. and whether you can keep operating. It's just, it's just another level of complexity that, that could blunt your vision for your practice. That is exactly why right now I don't want to be self-licensed as mm. well. There are so many parts of it. Um, like I have an accountant, Roxy, and... Mm. Um, the reason is I want objectivity. I want other people to do these functions so I don't have to do them and probably they can do it better than I can as well. So happy to outsource to parts of it so that I can focus on the bits that I like, same as I want from my clients, you know. And so tell me then, um, to deliver your advice, um, what's the the tech stack that you're operating on? Um, make sure we talk about the licensee as well though, right, because I think that um, for a while – Sorry, answer the wrong question, right? But the, um, for a long time, I feel like it was um, looking backwards and it was kind of getting beaten up. It felt like getting beaten up for other people's mistakes, a lot of the stuff. Well, financial planning felt like that for right. 10 years as well. Right. And it, being an AMP just, just magnified that. Yeah. yeah. I think um, people were disappointed with AMP because people expected that behavior from the big banks because they're big banks. AMP was supposed to be different. But I will genuinely say, I feel recently I've felt supported. Um, I feel like they they have a concept of accountability. They're not perfect. I don't know anyone that is. There's been a litany of of, um, of poor decisions and that sort of thing. But I feel recently, and people like Matt Lawler, I think, is doing a really good job. I'm not just saying that in case he listens. I think he's a good dude. Um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, when I first met him, I challenged him to stick around. I don't think that's why he stuck around. Roxy, this is not me claiming that. I'm well, like, he lasted longer than the business. But well, do you know this is the thing, though? I said, like, but... Having him at the helm of Newco um, makes me happy because yeah. it's accountability yeah. and it's actually doing stuff. It's people trying to make our advice world easier. And a lot of your um, peers have been, you know, the the the, the Fortnum Australian Unity Nexus and um, which was um, I think Associated Planners previously. Like they've been, um, although they've been a collaboration of, of people, they've, they've they've been very much in investment focused. They've been they've acted independently, independently minded. I think is the, the legal term I, I could, that I yeah. could use. Um, so, so tech stack. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you've got uh, you've got the wonderful people at Iris, which is part of uh, the, the, the the I suppose common denominator. But what do you what else do you do? I think they're the incumbents, right? Mm-hmm. And the, for better or worse, maybe it's like buying a, a hot dog at the footy. You don't have any other choice. So that's not quite true. There are other options. Um, my favourite thing at the moment is things that work. Um, we picked up um, we picked up work sort of because we needed revenue reconciliation. Yep. And that's our CRM. Yep. Um, I will say I feel like we've still got too much going on and we're refining this. We've used Astute Wheel for our engagement piece. Yep. Um, we've got Microsoft 365, which is fantastic. And, and, and you know what? The, the the thing with that one is most people are only peddling about 20, 30% of what it does. It's like our brains. Yeah. How much is un, untapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I'm, I speak with my, my other business partner in, in the debt business and um, he just goes, we just need to peel back this onion because it's just so much there and it does help your cybersecurity a lot. 100%. We invested a lot of money in that, like a disappointing amount of money and then I look at it um, with some recent you know, cyber blow-ups and, and it made me really happy that I had because a lot of the things, they did an audit through the whole licensee and our score was 70-something and I was like, oh, that's not great and they're like, no, we're looking at 16s and 20s. So um, having robust cybersecurity is immense. I, c- I don't want to be the next headline. I've got no interest in that. 
Um, but having that sort of stuff bolted down, so and so, they, and so you do the astute wheel for the the client facing stuff. Client you've engagement. Got, yeah. You've got the so um, you've got the workflow management that works sorted, and um, I suppose that leads me to um, we met um, uh, initially when you were looking at. Uh, I think there was a shortage of talent, and and you you investigated looking at um, people working offshore for doing things. And this is work sorted that remote work is that assisting with with having people in different locations. Yeah, I'd say so. I think any integrated system is your source of truth. Like this is the concept that you have one place that people can go to check where are we up to with a job. So if I disappear for good or for bad reasons, and someone calls in, a client calls in and says, "Where this? Where's this thing up to?" If someone can look in and say, "Here's where we're up to. Here's what's happening next." This is the beauty of a centralized system, remote, whatever. So we've got Art and Works in Melbourne most of the time. He's yep. our implementation guru. Yep. Um, Nancy and Mick have a day at home a week. Um, we have three um, beautiful people over in the Philippines. We've got Edda and Lynch and Jill. Um, Edda's been with me for over three years. Roxy. Good. And shout out, Edda. She's a teammate and she's a friend and she's just a gorgeous. She's been an absolute, can I say a rock? She's been a rock for me, Roxy. She's you, like, you can do that. We've had tumultuous times and she's um, she's been, you, you're like, that part's easy, that part's good. So and One one of the... One of the first employees of Ensemble um, is been with Ensemble six years, and she works in the Philippines as well. Yeah, about Queen, yeah. and uh, or Gooey as 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 she goes by. So, yeah, people are people, right? People are people, and if you treat people well, regardless of of, of, of borders, boundaries, and countries, then you get the great outcome. You said to me, um, if you treat them like a team member, this will work better, and we always have, and it, it's what we do anyway. But instead of treating someone like a resource, like these are team members. Well, I can tell you that it just. You know, a, a while ago, you gave me your five attributes of, of of the clients you want. And um, given my background in in, in being a client um, uh, of, of outsourcing uh, for many years, still a client massively, um, the people that don't get it probably never will. I You've got to treat them as people. I mean, and even a, a look at your website and the best practices that I interview in the engine room, regardless of the company that, um, uh, that, that operates for that outsourcing, full disclosure, I've got an interesting one. They have they include their people as people. You're all on the website, wonderful photos. They're they're part of your team. And I think when I talk about people and culture, um, that that fact uh, of lifting people up instead of holding people down um, is is common in the best practices that I interview. We have a rule: if you're in my corner, I'm in yours, um, and that's how it goes. And this includes um, I don't expect perfection because I'm far from perfect. I don't tell anyone this doesn't go out to public, does it? No, no, got no, got no, got no, but. Like these so people will include a far from perfect link. Um, there you go. Point. We look where um, these guys are in my corner. I'm so grateful for it, and they take a huge burden away from me, and they help. And with autonomy comes trust. And yep. if someone makes mistakes, they bring it to me, and we can fix it. So I noticed that that they're, they're doing some of the power planning. So your your associate advisors um, are not sort of they don't they're genuine associate advisors. You haven't got them associate advisors slash admin people because you've got different sort of uh, I suppose pods. And yeah. people in your workflow, which works really well. What um, with the types of clients you have, when you, I'm not going to call them pre-retirees because uh, you've just broken that word for me. Sorry about that. Um, do you do any life insurance at all? So, yeah, we do. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go no, no. I'm just saying. Um, and how do you how do you find the delivery of it? I mean, selling it's pretty easy, right? Like at the end of the day, um, and you would have learnt um that when you first started the soft skills around selling it. Um, how do you or how do you implement it at a at a at a price that or at a cost to you that doesn't hurt you that's such a good question i wrestle with this a lot okay we we do fee for service in that if you engage with us here is the fee based on your goals the complexity the scope we think we need to wrestle with to get the job done well that is the cost of doing it um if it includes insurance that is part of the scope and the complexity that we factor in uh it's a funny way to put it but we never count on commissions um and the reason for that is if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't work and it's not your fault and it's not my fault, we've still done the work and we will help do the next best scenario, whether that's pushing towards self-insurance. If, yeah. if you can't get in insurance, then the money that you were prepared to spend on premiums, we will build a version of self-insurance, like and building up your assets, reducing your debt, all, all those sort of things so that you've got a pot to reach for, a bucket that caters for these things when they arise. So it's still... Self-insurance is my favorite protection as opposed to product, but I've got a product for myself. Yep. 
the impact on my family if I'm not here, um, you know, two young, beautiful kids. That's why I've got life insurance. Well, we're tremendously underinsured, and, and and especially from an advice perspective, I wanted to ask that question. It is good that you, you, you're doing it and, and that you've articulated the value in a fee-for-service, which means that in the event you can't do it, you, you pivot into self-insurance or, or, or a hybrid. If, you know, I think you the key term it. is we're still trying to insure someone. Um, product is one way to do it. Part of risk management framework. Right. It's yep. one way to do it, and so is structures and all these sort of things. So. This is why it's within the scope and it's a thing that we charge for, whether or not the product lands or not. So insurance through product is rarely anything but a bag of cats these days. It's complex and we sort of forewarn clients that. Shout shout out to all of the insurance companies who follow this. And and look, (laughs) some of my favourite people in the industry have worked through the insurers, right? Through, um, you know, through Zurich and Tal and and plenty more. I shouldn't have named names because names, you know, on and on, right? Um, and They're listening, an, mate. They, 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 they do like playing um, uh, um, engine room bingo. So uh, it's, an, it's an evolving space. Let me put it that way. Yeah. So you know the the one that does really well. Sometimes they lose it and they drop off the perch, and others that work poor, they come through and they improve. You know, so oh. we're ha- we're happy to be product agnostic. Um, but the people that are delivering good stuff, that's what I care about. Um, but yeah, with insurance, I mean, we we recently had a vanilla. <laughs> client application and we all celebrated we were like oh this is like a unicorn you just don't encounter it without an exclusion or a loading or yeah so it is it's just it's a lot of work right and so and then i suppose the juxtaposition of that is how you've chosen to run your investments so do you have an sma or an mda or no we don't how do you run your investments a big flavor of the month um Right is about the simplicity for compliance for mda and, and totally get all that that's nothing but logical it took Mick um, to say in one of our meetings, he was like, it depends what you're moving from. Um, and so in our world, um, for a long while, we had a very complex model portfolio. Um, and I could talk to you about how good this thing is. And there's plenty of people that I love that are in this thing still, and it's holding its own. You know, cost and performance, this thing is holding its own, but it's not as simple as other solutions that we do for clients, um, which is my favorite. Well, what is simple to implement? For you, I imagine. Both of those things, right? And that is important. You can't throw that out the door um, because I, I feel like for a long time I was having the wrong conversations, Roxy. People were just talking to me about performance and I get it because you see, if you're uninitiated, you, you might see a financial advisor going, I need them to make like lift the black curtain and the black magic of investments and, and get me 20% a year sort of territory. And it, it's unrealistic and as much as I... Here's a funny point to make. I don't want to get beaten up for the bad markets, but I'm also one to highlight abnormally good markets. I'm delighted by it, but that's how much we don't have a crystal ball. So we kind of say, here's the bits we can control and here's the bits we can promise and let's build on that as a foundation. Here's the bits that we can't control, uh, which is what happens in the markets. We can control your exposure to the markets. We make that sensible relative to the goal and the time frame. That's one of the biggest things. Um, and we, we sort of go from there, but it's got to be logical to the client rather than me saying, you know, obviously we've got our views of, um, of what makes sense, but simple is good, you know, build a good, simple solution. Uh, we use a lot of index funds, uh, not for everything, um, but we use a lot of index funds because a lot of the Spiva data that I look at, you've seen the Spiva website. I have, yes, yes, yes. yes. It's compelling, you know. Um, and, and, and it also... Um, you know, that's the same reason a lot of people use ETFs as well. Um, so it's very similar. We use active where appropriate, <coughs> yep. okay, and this has got to be client-specific. If we add complexity, it's got to make it better for the client goal, the client outcome. I'm happy to use a strategic leaning towards income or yep. towards growth, depending on where they're up to. They might have a bias towards ESG or, or something like that, and we're happy to cater for that. But it's got to make sense. Is there any platforms that you want to give a shout out to who have worked well with you? Yeah, there's a there's a lot actually. I think um, there are platforms we haven't even used a whole lot of that they've still done good gear. I won't I won't say who they are, but we look. You can. I think in, they'll be you know, in, in particular. I want to say that we we have a lot of North, um, which is a wonderfully functional platform. We have a lot of ART, the Australian Retirement Trust, and I feel like they've done. The way I'd put it is if we're teaching our kids to swim and there's a current, in, as an industry fund, instead of swimming against the current, swim with the current. So I've found that they've been open to working with us and we've got a really good dialogue. Same with Norse. Like, you know, this is what matters to me is if we're trying to deliver a service and an outcome for our clients, if we have human beings that care that we can talk about rather than a generic call center, you know, the 
I'm going to throw Telstra under the bus, but when you call under, call in and you get bounced around to three different departments and then the last guy goes, is there anything else I can help you with? And you're like, you haven't helped me yet, mate. Have <laughs> like, so, you got time for a survey? <laughs> yeah. So so when you can connect with someone that helps get an outcome done when it matters, because yeah. these are human beings connected to it at the other end of it, that I really, really love. So just shifting gears, um, you're in Budrup. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a physical office there, although you've disclosed it um, uh, for for uh, strategic reasons, you, you, yourself and your wife work remote. Does everyone else um, is is for everyone else local other than the the, the chap in? Absolutely not. Absolutely no, we, not. <laughs> we have um, so Nancy, Mick, Dan, and myself will be in there most days, yep. right? Um, this is the Budrum crew. Yep. Um, we have Artin that is based in Melbourne. Yep. He's currently in Thailand. He's worked for us while he's been in other countries. He's bounced around the Mediterranean. Um, it, it's not just COVID that exposed it. It doesn't really matter. We use a phone system called Avora, which, um, you know, it shows that someone's calling from our office, whether they're in Melbourne yep. or in Turkey. Um, and I think that that is important, um, so long as we're really careful with our cyber protocols. So, so when you're, um, when's, when's, who was your last hire? Our last hire was Dan. Dan, yeah, so he's a local local boy. Um, he's worked for a, a friend of mine who's a, a business and yeah. advice business on the coast. Um, it was brilliant because I got to talk to him a lot about this guy before we hired him. And, and do your clients? Uh, what percentage of your clients come to you? Uh, I'd say, look, we have clients that are interstate. Um, I feel old fashioned that I'm going to say this out loud, but I have clients in Melbourne that I've looked after for years and I've never met them face to face. But I reckon well, that's cool. You, you were effectively a client of mine for four years. True. And, we, and here we are. We met this morning. So face to face. Yeah, but this is the, look, I think this shows why it doesn't matter. So I think the discerning feature for finding a good professional need not be geography, but human beings, we like eyeballing people. It's how we connect with someone. Yeah. So I think the initial engagement is easier in person. Yeah. Um, and then the continuity can happen more easily remotely. However, it's not essential. I would say- Anyone that's within striking distance comes and sees us locally. We yeah. do occasional trips up to sort of the Fraser Coast, Harvey Bay, Maryborough, that sort of territory. I'll do trips to Sydney for some clients. I have a vested interest because I can hang out with friends and family there as well. Same deal with Melbourne. I've got friends and family there as well. So, you know, we'll go down and see clients interstate. But rather than it, – it'll be more built around um, ticking a couple of boxes, you know. So to answer your question, I think – 80% of our clients see us in the office. Yeah, because you you said earlier that um, the big thing was that uh, you want to get their trust uh, very quickly and then you can you can operate. You can roll the sleeves up or keep them rolled up. Um, so if I'm if, – if, and I'm, I'm putting together my Venn diagram of, of, of where you're at. Um, so you've got, uh, you've got that statement. You've got the fact that you can take clients from anywhere. The fact that you will be able to and you have, you're very open-minded to having um, people work anywhere. Notwithstanding that, given that eighty uh, percent of your clients come to the office, the ad- front-facing advisor probably um, would be most likely to be within shooting distance of of, of the Sunshine Coast. Um, but the other part of the engine room is you said that you're over capacity, right? So you're ready to go, you're ready to take clients on, um, and the call to action because we spoke about this earlier, you know. You're over capacity. You've you've built a bit of an engine room. You've got some some form in what you're doing. You're happy where you are in in the licensing structure that you, you you've got. Um, you're not old. You, you're quite young, right? Um, are you open to people moving into your business? Would that how how would that work, right? So, say for instance, I'm a great financial planner. Um, but I don't like running the business of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't want to go and work for a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, have you got any, you know, opinion on whether that would work for you? Yeah, hundred percent. If it's not an option, it's not an option. So I think I'll talk to any opportunity, any option. We have an amazing base of advisors. I feel like if you lingered through the adversity, like advisors love whinging about how hard our job is. If you'll let us, if you're still here, you might be here for the right reason. Well, it's not hard when there's thirty percent even. Right. <laughs> Well, there is this, right? This is a thing, but no, but this is straight up um, basic e- economic supply and demand. Correct. There is an absolute abundance of work out there. Um, so getting it done, um, but doing it the right way, it's kind of about what we don't do as well as what we do. That's the John West factor, right? Um, it's what John West regrets. 
So I managed rejects, to rejects. rejects. <laughs> I managed to get a John West rejects quote in, but I earlier on um, when you said you wanted to uh, um, you know cut and run fast, I wanted to do the quote from the movie Heat. Go, um, but oh, go, go! You're giving me that one. No, I'm not going to, but I will now. Uh, don't let yourself get attached to anything you're not willing to walk out in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around the corner. Oh, scorching. I mainly did that for Kieran and I's personal enjoyment. We try to get Kieran it, it every time. He does. He does. But um, far from walking out, um, uh, so you're open to that. Um, when, where, like, given that you've got the accounting background, that you've come from that, do you have associations with accounting firms, like B2B B B associations where you- Yeah, look, clients? we do. We've got, um, I'd say, a little bit in Sydney. Yeah. Um, so this is always an avenue, a little bit in uh, in Melbourne to a small point, um, mostly around Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast. So my own accountant is up at Coolum, um, and she's wonderful. She's a good operator. Um, the So, look, I think the idea of a future partnership in something like that makes total sense to me. I think it would require someone that leave, uh, lives and breathes accounting the way I live and breathe advice. Yeah. Um, but also understands that the synergy can be a beautiful thing, you know. So I think that um, to use your expression of call to action, it would be those sort of like-minded businesses that kind of see, um, I think ego gets in the way of getting good advice, but it, also giving good advice. So I think a lot of um, professionals don't, they're fearful of losing the relationship. They're fearful of not being the most important person in that client's life. So someone that kind of sees the beautiful harmonies that can be there, you know, the synergy, the cohesion when it all comes together. They're the sort of businesses I'd like to talk to. And in terms of clients, um, sorry, prospective employees, I think, it's anyone that cares, right? It'd have to be someone that, imagine if you could job interview for people that care, but we like our crew deeply cares and that's my favourite thing um, is um, they'll go above and beyond when they need to. I won't need to ask them to, they'll just do it. Um, but they're the sort of people I would like to have working with me not for me, with me. Yep. Um, in terms of building something bigger and better. Okay, so you put your wish list out there. I get that, but I'm about to challenge it. Go. Okay. You've given us an idea of what your business looks like today in 2024. But as the leader and as the visionary leader, where's this business going to be in 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 three or five years from a from a size, a scale, a profitability? What's your vision? Because because yes, it's nice to work with nice people. Okay, and that's a non-negotiable. But leaders have to lead. So. Um, if I was to ask you, where's the crew wealth going to be in three or five years' time? As far as some metrics, go for it. Where if this is your job interview? No, but you know this is <laughs> you know this is underway. Absolutely, this, um, this is us looking at um, having a firm business plan and where we want to be, the sort of business we're going to be, that sort of territory. We look this employee share scheme is because we want to reward. Uh, we want to have a crew where we're not the plumbers with the leaky taps. You know, we want to be living and breathing. We want our guys to be living and breathing and enjoying the fruits of running a good advice business. We want them to be doing it. So we're looking at um, employee share scheme options as a way to have long-term alignment. Absolutely. Um, and the sort of business that we are, I don't need to take over the East Coast. That's not my aspiration. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to I want to build up. Uh, I want to have um, at least you know, two or three other advisors that aren't me in the practice. We'll have a practice manager, um, sort of operations and practice management that helps with the cadence of meetings and activity and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So that it, And what sort of number of clients do you, this is your three-year plan, what number of clients do you need? Look, I think loosely on the pod system idea of having um, an advisor and integrated and some shared support, not just dedicated per advisor because I feel like that's a different risk. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in both. Um you know, it, it would be that every advisor, I think, has capacity. And um, this might sound unusual. I don't really mind whether you have 10 spectacular clients that pay us $50,000 a year or whether you have – I'd rather not have 500 clients that pay us $1,000 a year. That doesn't make sense. So we have a minimum in terms of what it looks like. But I think in terms of saturation, I think an advisor with good support can look after something like 120 clients. Groups. Yeah, and so if you get if you if you if you're getting an average annual fee of five to seven thousand dollars, then 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 that's definitely uh, you're on the path to value. And, and this is where we're at, right? So without benchmarking, without comparing, without seeing um, what these things are, we can't manage it. We can't project. And this is the big exercise that we've been going through at the moment is looking at the numbers and where we want to be. And so, Roxy, to answer your question, if we've got um, three other advisors, then that's you know times. 120, 100 or 120, you've got 300, um, 360 client groups. Yeah. 
you know, um, more than that if you include me. Maybe you round up to 40 because I deal with fewer <laughs> because I'm working more on the business. But maybe with three other advisors, you've got 400 clients. Well, now we're talking substantial, right? Because so, so once you've got that, once you've got the EBIT, then those people that you're building this wonderful ESOP for actually have got something that they can, that they and their families can put a genuine tilt at for a genuinely commercial period of time and share in the gain um, as as really good quality businesses. So, is there anything um, that we've left out? One, but thank you. We're both in our we're both uh, uh, mobile today. We're uh, we're both uh, shoeless because we're um, we're sort of sitting on lounges and it's it's quite cool so for everyone who's uh listened to a lot of our podcasts this is probably the trendiest room i've ever been in as i'm what are we looking at i've got a couple of pictures i think it's worth everyone knowing that you're wearing a tie and i'm not so thank you for wearing a tie that's um i'm glad you care about dressed up for you mate i saw i saw you i saw your your picture on linkedin which was 15 years old and i thought oh he is is a fetching everyone tells me he's a fetching rooster (laughs) it's not actually my linkedin photo is on, on the website though, and on the business card, people are like you need a new photo. I'm like that was last year. Yeah, oh, that's got it. Is no hair now. That's um, I'm a super grateful person, very deliberately. But I think on my journey, all the people that I've encountered, I'm a very collaborative person as well. I feel like you can learn something from absolutely everyone if you'll park your ego and listen. Um, so I think um, there are so 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 many people, you know, from my parents, my wife, um, my mentors, my friends, my peers that we've mentioned some of the names today. The danger of naming some names is you exclude others, but like honestly, I've got so many people to thank for what I feel is a, a very, very rich life that I get to live. Very rewarding career. Um, it's complete, like absolutely fulfilling. I've loved advice since I first met it. I'm really loving doing advice again, and, and, and with the future a good, is bright. With a good structure, advice will love you and your family too, right? Ooh, I like that. So, um, on behalf of of uh, Ensemble. Um, which is uh, all about the positive evolution of financial advice. Um, it's great to hear stories, which is evolu- which are evolutions of where you're at. It's great to have uh, someone who's clearly um, focused on 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 the empathy, the the, the caring for clients, for family, for partner, for uh, for everyone, and who has also then taken steps to make sure that that is a profitable outcome, which is all part of the caring. So on behalf of the Engine Room, um, Gus, I'd like to thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to wish uh, the Accrue Wealth uh, team um, around Australia all the best and thank you for being part of the Engine Room. We'll accept the good wishes and thanks so much for having us. My pleasure. Cheers, mate.